U.S. President Joe Biden on that four-day trip to Europe trying to rally a global challenge to Russia, attending a NATO meet on Thursday, the military alliance saying that they will send more troops to member nations in Eastern Europe, but not troops on the ground in Ukraine itself. Here is a report. Putin war machine rolls on, slowly, but with no signs of stopping. The raging war has galvanized the West to get its act together. The urgency, evident as United States President Joe Biden air-dashed to Brussels for a power pack Thursday. Three unprecedented back-to-back -back emergency summits of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, G7 nations, and the European Union. The aim is to take more punitive measures against Russia and add more muscle to Ukraine's defenses. We believe in democracy, in the rule of law, in the defense of human rights, in the values that underpin all of our societies. That's why this illegal, brutal invasion of a friendly democracy in Ukraine by Vladimir Putin is absolutely unacceptable. NATO and partners around the world are united in condemning and standing up to Russia. The West's options are limited. It has already declared it won't join the war. What their military alliance NATO would do is strengthen its defenses in Eastern European member nations by sending more troops and equipment. It will also supply more arms and ammunition to Ukraine to fight any escalation by the invading Russian forces. But they also need to calibrate a response to frequent nuclear saber rattling by Russia. The West's assistance, however, might not be enough to satisfy Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. He wants the West to be more proactive. На цих трьох самітах буде наша позиція, міцна позиція. На цих трьох самітах ми побачимо, хто друг, хто партнер, а хто продався і зрадив. Життя можна захистити тільки у єдності. Свобода, вона має бути озброєною. There are reasons for Zelensky to be disappointed. While the US and its allies have imposed many sanctions on Russia, Europe still buys gas from Moscow. Ukrainian voices have time and again complained that doing business with Moscow is as good as financing the war. Western nations, meanwhile, have announced fresh sanctions to corner Russia. The United Kingdom has slapped 65 more sanctions against Russian business groups and individuals, including the Wagner Group, described as Putin's private army, and Russian Foreign Minister's stepdaughter, Polina Kovaleva. But will all this be enough to stop the war? A top European Union diplomat, Joseph Borrell, has warned Russia will not be serious about peace talks until it secures itself a position of strength. The war may not be ending anytime soon. With Gaurav Savant in Warsaw, Poland and Gita Mohan in Moscow, Bureau Report, India Today. So will Joe Biden's booster for Ukraine now work? What are America's options really against Russia? Can economic sanctions stop Russia? What is the end game in the Ukraine war? What role will NATO now play? Joining us now, two special guests, Dr. Daniel Hamilton, his fellow Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C., Benjamin Friedman, Policy Director, Defense Priorities in Washington. Both of you, particularly Dr. Hamilton, have looked at Europe very closely. Dr. Hamilton, what role are you seeing as a result of the visit of Joe Biden? Is it purely symbolic to galvanize uh, 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 Europe into, or the Western world into concerted action against uh, Russia, or do you see something more substantive emerging, given the fact at the moment that troops on the ground or no-fly zone are not on the horizon? Well, it's very substantial. It goes beyond symbolism. The president is ensuring that there is remarkable unity among the West. The West is not divided, contrary to what one of your correspondents said. Mm -hmm. It's a really a projecting an image of unity. And I should say it's not about just Europe and the United States. It's Many, many other countries have joined in the sanctions and then shaming Russia. The General Assembly did that. Uh, Japan, South Korea, a number of other countries have joined in. The United States announced today it would take in 100,000 refugees from Ukraine itself. Mm -hmm. uh, there is continued supplies of lethal aid to Ukraine. The opposition to the no-fly zone is not about the notion. It's that it's not the most effective thing to do 
to help Ukraine because those planes would have to fire on sovereign Russian territory. We would simply widen the war. Mm -hmm. The more effective support are lethal aid, uh, surface to air missiles, which are being supplied, lots of other types of things like that, anti-tank. These are all having an effect. You can see the Russian offensive is actually stalled. They haven't taken any major city. There's probably going to be an operational pause coming up in which either Russia uh, works to our ceasefire mm -hmm. and some type of settlement or doubles down and tries to escalate. Uh, either way, the West needs to be provided. And as you said, what's the end game? Unfortunately, win, lose, or draw for Putin, the end game is going to be a persistent confrontation with Russia uh, across the European continent mm -hmm. and a central Europe that's going to remain turbulent, uncertain, and sporadically violent for the next decade or more. That and that's the new Europe that we're looking at. Benjamin Friedman, what's your say? Are you as optimistic that uh, President Biden's effort to bring together this Western alliance can put sufficient pressure on the Russians, can enable the Ukrainians to hold out long enough, as our reporters are saying on the ground, increasingly, bit by bit, parts of Ukraine are falling into Russian hands. Well, uh, I, I think that the, the uh, Russians have indeed stalled. Uh, I don't think it's fair to say uh, they're winning in a, at a rapid pace, but uh, I do think there's nothing happening right now to Russia that is unfortunately unsustainable and that I think they can continue the war mm -hmm. uh, despite the financial uh, and military pressure they're under. Uh, and uh, if things keep going the way they are, they will probably win in the sense of taking more territory and, and potentially Kiev, although uh, it's it's uncertain. Uh, so I hope uh, what the United States and, and President Biden is doing uh, with this NATO summit is to try to press the NATO allies to do things that will encourage diplomacy to settle the war. We're kind of at a crossroads here where we can decide, well, we're just going to keep up pressure on Russia and flood more weapons into Ukraine and see if we can bleed Russia, which will be good for us in the long term, or uh, at something that, that I think would be better for Ukraine in the long term, we can press for a settlement and do things like relaxing sanctions in the event that Russia pulls out and making it clear that we'll do so. No, but what's uh, the, sorry to intervene, uh, Mr. Friedman, what's the basis of a, what kind of settlement can be achieved? Here is a country which has gone and bombed Ukraine out of sight. What is that settlement? Can Russia now, having done what it's done, stop short of a regime change? Yes, uh, I think that the settlement would be basically uh, U.S. and NATO country, European countries lack sanctions uh, in the event that Russia pulls out its troops. Ukraine declares neutrality, changes its constitution to do that. Uh, it recognizes, unfortunately, uh, Russian control of Crimea and uh, settles Donbass, the Donbass region in some way that it either gives autonomy or completely lets it go. I think that that's the unpleasant reality that a settlement would entail. Dr. Hamilton, do you see that a, a real possibility, a settlement now, the longer this continues? Or do you see the Russians digging their heels in that Putin, having gone so far, has no option, irrespective of what NATO and the U.S. does at the moment? Well, as I say, I see two, two scenarios. One is we do head to a ceasefire. The other is the Russians double down. But they will need time to do that. So in terms of an ultimate settlement, I think anytime you negotiate and settle something with a gun to your head, that's not going to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. So even if uh, the settlement is as uh, Ben just outlined, that won't be sustainable over time. The Ukrainian people will never accept that over time. And that's my point. This will remain an area of persistent confrontation and instability, regardless of that type of settlement. The mm -hmm. only settlement I see is what I would call a process settlement, that is, you agree to a pr political process mm -hmm. to uh, try to arrange things over time. Neither side really backs down, mm -hmm. but you agree to a political process. We had that before since 2014 called the Minsk process. It didn't work. Mm -hmm. But I think no Ukrainian president is going to be able to stay in office mm -hmm. and agree to the Russian annexation of Ukrainian territory. It's just not going to happen. Okay. So if they sign something like that, it won't be sustainable and it'll just revert back to instability later. Dr. Hamilton and Benjamin Friedman, I appreciate both of you joining us, giving us a perspective there from Washington. Thank you so much for joining me here tonight on the news today. Appreciate that.